Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and all between. Fred, my brother, how you doing? Hello, Vince. I'm doing great. And you, sir? Good. Mr. Metalhead Fred Bonanno filling in for Jason. Jason is getting his eyes dilated. I actually think he's oh. his, uh, his rear end checked, but that's what he that's what he told us. Anyway. <laughs> Either way, his eyes are watering at the moment. Uh, but, yeah, and I know he wanted to be here too, because we got Oh, I mean I couldn't sleep last night. I was so yeah, excited, like special. all these questions, you know. And normally you uh, normally you tell me to introduce the guests, but there is no introduction I could do to justify the gentleman we're about to bring out now. So we'll just bring him out. He is synonymous with heavy metal drumming, uh, Sabbath, Dio, Last in Line, you name it. We're going to get into much of it as we can. So let's please welcome uh, to Creativity Talking, Vincent Sampson Apiece, Vinny Apiece. Apathy. Damn it. I told and you, I, Fred, Fred. I even made this fucking sign for you. App there you go. <laughs> and I've got it written down here, App C2, and I still blew it. Damn it. I'm sorry. Oh, man. I'm going to give you shit for the next 10 years. Carmine's, uh, Carmine's, a, Carmine's a piece. Yeah. yeah Carmine's a piece. App C. How did you guys figure that out? Or did it just happen? Well, Carmine used to fault? say, he used to say apathy. Okay. And there's a live vanilla fudge album from the late, I don't know when that was the late sixties or early seventies. And after the drum solo, the bass player, Tim Bogus says, Carmine apathy on the drums. So it was apathy. That's what my father said. And right. then when he joined Rod Stewart, uh, Carmine, uh, Rod was like, how do you pronounce this name? I hear it all different ways. I hear it a piece and this and this one and that one. So Carmine said, well, what do you think? I said, a piece. So Rod kind of started it. So <laughs> Carmine changed his name to a piece. Right. And I was just getting going with Rick Derringer at that that time. And I said, I'm not going to be a piece. Nah. Sounds like a piece of pizza or something, you know. Uh, <laughs> so. Okay. So I, I want to know how cool were your parents? Well, my parents were very cool. Uh, they were very supportive. And for me, it was easy because Carmine was already uh, out doing gigs with the, you know, he, he joined the fudge and they were doing good gigs and he was successful. So I started playing and then uh, I started hooking up. I hooked up with John Lennon at one point at 16 years old. And that's crazy. And started doing stuff. Then I told my parents, I said, nah, I don't want to go finish high school. I'm going to quit. So they said, OK see what happens and uh i went eventually went and got the ged equivalency thing later on but uh, i i'm also with one with jed oh yeah 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 i okay. couldn't i couldn't do it man you know yeah no way i was in you didn't what the ged oh yeah no high school i just couldn't do it yeah yeah well i was working with lennon at, at, at night in the studio at the record plant studios in new york we were hanging out and doing all sorts of stuff and then i go into high school the next day you know, and uh, it was like going to a different world. Oh, for sure. Yeah. No, for sure. Okay, so when you started getting into so you saw your brother get basically famous, and, of course, you have to have the chops in order to play with anybody. Yeah. And so did you learn, did he teach you a lot? Did he say, watch out for this, this, and this, or did you just observe and note it? Uh, mostly observe, because uh, when he started doing the fudge and they started getting famous and blah, blah, blah. Uh, they were on the road a lot. So only time I really saw him is when he came off the road and came to the house in Brooklyn, visit yeah. my parents. And then, uh, of course we had drums there. So he would, we'd go downstairs. He'd show me a couple of things and, uh, check out how I'm playing. That was it. So yeah. not a lot of time spent together at that point. So did your parents ever get phone calls? Say, do you got another drummer? Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, well, later, later on, I, I met Rick Derringer at the New York studio, uh, record plant studios. And, uh, he liked the way I played and he heard the, the things we did at the record plant with Jimmy Iveen. And he called my house, my parents' house looking for me. Yeah. And my mother's going, no, you must be looking for Carmine. I said, no, I'm looking for Vinny. I'm putting a band together. Oh, you must be you sure you're not looking for Carmine. <laughs> so finally I was in Louisiana playing with a band called Axis. So, uh, yeah, finally 
she gave him the number and he called. And then uh, I remember some, I was outside somewhere and somebody go, Danny, hey, wake down with your phone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I listened to the Axis album last night on YouTube. Oh, you did? Yeah. And it totally makes sense that Sabbath called you, that brought you in. Totally makes sense. Yeah. Well, that was produced by Andy Johns and the drum sound really good drum sound it wasn't no cheesy sounding record he did right. a great job and we played together for a bit before that so we were tight and uh when i first met tony iomi to go down to to meet they said you want to come down meet tony we're looking for a drummer okay tony walked in with that album <clears throat> and he said this is good really good so that probably opened the door wide open and said i think this guy could handle it you know so early on, of course, you got to play with uh, Mr. John Lennon as the band of motherfuckers, the BOMF. Yeah, BOMFs. We couldn't think of any names. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> so we needed a name. Hey, band of motherfuckers, BOMF. Yeah. You know, nobody knew what it meant. So yeah. I had a project band called uh, CRM, the Rotten Crotch Mongrels. There but, you go. <laughs> so yeah. we were it... going to do it. We were going to use that name, but it was taken. <laughs> So after, so after playing with Lennon and then you get and then you're walking in, you know, not too much, you know, too much later, you're in the studio with Black Sabbath or the rehearsal space. Did right. that lessen the blow or were you still like, well, what? Well, you know, I was always pro about whatever I was doing, you know. Yeah. So when we met Lennon, we did all this stuff with Lennon. I was like, OK, cool. Right. I know who 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 he is, obviously, and I was we I was never a real fanboy. And right. Sabbath I listened to, but I wasn't a big fan of Sabbath either. I was more into Led Zeppelin, which so, I think was which made right. your era stick out so much more in Black Sabbath is that you weren't a Sabbath guy. I wasn't intimidated, right? <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> they said they need a drummer, so I went down, met Tony. He said, "Come down to rehearsal." And then the next day I met Ronnie and Geezer and Jeff Nichols, keyboard player. And uh, so I wasn't really that intimidated. I was just checking it all out, you know, and, right. uh, you know, eyes open, ears open just to see how they played. I was very kind of pro uh, right. not not like, oh, my God, I'm playing with Tony. And Geezer. right. You were already a perfect. <laughs> You weren't a guy coming off from, you know, let's say playing on the strip or, you know, right. in, in a club guy. That's right. So that that was cool. And then we played a couple songs. First song we played was Neon Nights. And the only reason why we played that, they said, what what song do you know? And I wasn't a big Sabbath fan. So yeah, I, I heard Neon Nights on the radio a couple of weeks before. This is amazing. Played it. Yeah. And they Neon said, uh, this is uh, Black Sabbath with Ronnie James Dio. And I listened to it driving. I said, wow, that's a, that singer is really good. I wasn't familiar with Ronnie either. Right. I heard Man on a Silver Mountain and, and Long Love Rock and Roll. But <clears throat> uh, so I knew that song started and there was only one break in the middle and then it continued <laughs> out. So I thought that's easy. So that's right. the song we played. Now, did you take any lessons or are you self taught or did you just. You know, as well, osmosis from your brother as a kid coming up. Uh, no, I took lessons from the same teacher that he did. Actually, I don't know if you can see it, but over there, see that pet, that white? That's the yeah. books. That's the book I went through, a couple of books from this 68, 69. And it's set up there with a pad. I go as much as I can, go there and read the pages and get faster and blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> and... uh it's still there. So I took lessons for about three years. And okay. What's funny is those three years weren't only one part of it was on the drums, and that was a jazz kind of book. So mm -hmm. you could hear what you were playing. Everything else was on the pad, marching, marching books. That's called stick control. Yeah. Another one's called syncopation. These days, kids don't have any patience. You know, no. I did do some lessons, but it's like, yeah, they want to learn licks. Hey, here's a lick. Yeah, blah, 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 but they don't right, right, right. <laughs> understand it. So, <clears throat> you know what I just did <laughs> on Friday? I went to my great nephew's kindergarten class, and I brought in a little set of drums, bright red, and all. You know, when they went to lunch, we brought the drums in. We yeah. set it up, and they came back, 
It was 29 kids. And they were, this on my Facebook, and they were fantastic. They went crazy and asking all sorts of questions. That was like one of my best audiences. I That's said, any awesome. questions? And they're all, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, did you bring the cocktail kit with you for that one? No, I brought the kit. I could see it. It's up there red. See that red up there? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. It's a little red kit from uh, this Sawtooth is with uh, my drum company. Okay. And... Uh, Sorry about that. And um, I brought that kit. I only brought a snare drum and a floor tom and a little bass drum. Okay. High hat. That's all. And uh, we went, I showed him a couple of things. And then we learned, we will rock you. Oh, so yeah. We were trying to get half the class to go boom, boom, stomping it. But the problem was it was a concrete floor. You couldn't hear it. Right. So we did the hand class. <laughs> boom, boom. And to get the other half going, bop, boom, boom, bop. Nice. So we had the teacher had to help and my sister was there. She helped get it organized. And then I played the song. I had it on the phone and through a little amp and uh, they knew the song. It's funny. Kindergarten. Right. Kids know that song. It's such a popular song. So it was a, a total experience. And then uh, then I said, anybody want to play the drums? And they all raised their hands. So now I got 20, <laughs> 29 kids. They all came up each of them and uh, played for like 15, 20 seconds. Even the principal from the school came in and she got up and played. And the teacher, oh, it was funny as shit. You know? so, <laughs> I had a good any time. Of them, any of them want to learn how to spin the drumstick like that? Well, you know what? I forgot about that. I really don't do it, but I twirled at the end and I could see some of the yeah. faces go, <gasps> oh my God. So yeah. my wife, my wife's in a in a band and she sings, but she is determined to learn how to spin a drumstick. So she's yeah. been watching videos on it. This, by the way, is uh, oh, yeah, there you go. drumsticks from the uh, last in line last time you guys were at the Arcada. Oh, okay. But you'll cool. be back right. in October, and then you'll be back there uh, in a couple weeks with your uh, neon yeah, nights. Sabbath, Sabbath your nights. Sabbath nights. Sabbath nights. Yeah. yeah. And <clears throat> Angel. Yeah, that's going to be a good show. I'm planning on being there. Be yeah, cool. shout out to Ron Anesti, who does a lot for sh the Chicago music scene, man. Shout out to yes. Ron. is the best, yeah. you know. I mean, he's got the two venues, and he's so proactive and yeah. totally Ron, uh, loves it, loves the music. Right. And, and he's he brings the owner. fans in, and it's unbelievable. Oh, he, he's, keeping, he's keeping music alive, <clears throat> not just heavy metal, everything. I mean, he'll have a yeah. rock band there, and then he'll have Debbie Boone there, and then he'll have Engelbert Humperdinck. Yeah, Just keep the music alive. Yeah, and he even has tribute Great bands. Man. You know, when there's not a national act, the tribute bands, and he keeps the whole thing going. And uh, he was the first one to to want to book the Sabbath Night show. And uh, he's a great guy. And we did a a, a video, not a video, and a stream. Carmine and I and Ron called Head yeah. uh, Bang Head was it Hanging and Banging, Hanging and Banging. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that was it. So. Uh, you're gonna we ask you, are you still doing that, or is that? Uh, nah. you know, it happened. It was good at pandemic because a lot of musicians yeah. were home; they were yeah. available. <clears throat> the tours weren't happening, and uh, it was easy to get people on the show. <clears throat> then, then it became harder to book people on the show, and and uh, right. so we 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 finally called it a day. Said, all right, this was fun. So now, the back to we will rock you and the bus ride on the way home and <laughs> freshman and sophomore year because i didn't make it much past that <laughs> dude the bus goom, goom, pa, goom. every every day we'd sing that song on the yeah. way home that was like the highlight of the day you know what a clever song you know just oh, totally get that rhythm going and then just simple vocals over it and it's a short yeah. song and it works and and they use it yeah. at all the sporting events and oh my god and anyone can join in and still sound it sounds okay, you know. Yeah, sing the yeah. chorus. <laughs> and speaking of like little kids, I saw this TikTok the other day, and it was this second grade teacher, and she starts playing um uh John Denver in the class. Oops. And within 20 seconds, the whole class is singing with her, and she's like blown away. John Denver? Yeah. Rocky Mountain High, <laughs> they're all singing. And she's like, what is going oh, on? You know, like. Wow. <laughs> I'm surprised. I thought you were going to say they booed her. Oh, uh, right. <laughs> yeah. In 20 she seconds, now, they all went, boom. Currently looking for work. 
no. But, uh, <laughs> so you've done many drum drum clinics. You also break down songs and how they're played correctly. And I was uh, uh, learning the intro to We Rock uh, last night, and I'll be learning again today and tomorrow. <laughs> Uh, teachers are important, and uh, if you want to play hard rock or heavy metal, I mean, you are the guy to learn from. I mean, the heavy metal, the sound changed. Like, when, if we had to send one person to the aliens and say, this is a heavy metal hard rock drummer, it would be you, like your oh. sound. Everyone's always chased that. Right, right. Yeah, I would go. I mean, I'm not the hardcore metal. I'm more the heavy right, rock. Right, classic, yeah. <clears throat> classic, you know more of the old school stuff but uh you know i listen to bonham john bonham mitch mitchell from hendrix and uh, yeah. uh guys like that and now it's turned into almost scientific you know it's pretty oh, crazy sure. some of the drumming so but and, i i do a live stream actually today at 4 p.m la time on my facebook Vinny apathy official right on. and <clears throat> i've been doing this for almost three years now <laughs> it's funny because of, the drum companies, uh, Chromacast and Sawtooth, Sawtooth Drums, and uh, they wanted me to do something for a couple months, so I did, and it, and it went over really well. So now here we are three years later, and it's like <clears throat> I'm still doing it. But you run out of stuff after a while. You, before it was like, I'd right. show some foot exercises. You know, I'll do this, or teach. Uh, now it's just like I'll play to a couple of songs and then whatever I feel like I'll get into a groove and I'll explain what I did. And then we take right. questions and answers. And uh, It's a cool show. So 4 yeah. p.m. Uh, specific time. I've never seen anyone explain the wedding of the finger hitting the tom and moving. Oh, yeah. That was the first time I ever saw anyone explain that. And you have patience when you're talking about it because a lot of people will be like, bada, 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 bada. here's what you do. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, Dude. when you got to you got to. Well, I've, I've been to a lot of drum clinics back in the day when I was growing up. There, there used to be a lot of drum clinics. You know, uh, I grew up in Brooklyn, so you had Sam Ash and uh, Music Store or uh, there wasn't Guitar Center. It was mainly Sam Ash. They brought in a lot of people, Billy Cobham and my brother mm -hmm. and all these guys that do clinics. And uh, sometimes some of the stuff you learned, even online, you go, well, I'm going to do this paradiddle, uh, diddle, blah, 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 and they do it. And go, blah, 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 you know, and I'd always say, what is that? You know, right. Buddy Rich. <laughs> you look at Buddy Rich play, you go, wait, what is that slow? Right. Right. And that's why that stayed in my head. So when I show something, I'll do it very slow yeah, and then use it normally and then show it fast. Right. And that's the best way to learn, you know can't pick it up listening to it fast yeah like i mean you sound different you know of course mr neil peart sounded different and alex van halen and yeah the, the commonality with all you guys is jazz my dad was a huge jazz head so i came up with you know buddy rich max roach gene krupa Wes montgomery rashid ali uh, yeah. Billy Hart, sonny Payne from count basie you know Actually, All Max Max Roach came up with a lot of the stuff Bonham was doing. Yeah. All that shit. You right. listen to some of those jazz albums, Max Roach was doing it on the toms. And they, you know, with one mic, it sounded big. <laughs> uh, that's where this stuff comes from. And then right. it's embellished and, and taken further, you know. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, oh, our, our usual co-host, Jason, which we were college roommates way back in the day. Um, he actually, uh, recorded Black Sabbath, uh, Tampa at the Sun Dome for the D, uh, humanizer tour. He was the sound. Oh, wow. Yeah. So he's bummed that he couldn't say hi to you again, but, uh, ah, tell him I said know. hi. Yeah. There's a Jason. The there, okay. There's me when, you know, when we were both little kids, you know, God, but. you look like girls. <laughs> I know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? I don't know, man. Age, you know? <laughs> Could have been this, Vinny. I'm not quite sure, but uh... you in the background, the green guy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Now, speaking of humor, I uh, was I was listening to an interview, and I've seen this before, of Ronnie talking about how you love to do practical jokes. Yeah, yeah, yes. And there's a story about briefcase and the pyro guy shaky. <clears throat> well. Yeah, back in the Dio days, you know, we played a gig and then we go to the hotel bar. We'd be hanging out 
And then the tour manager would come in with his briefcase, which I didn't realize contained a lot of effing money. Right, right, right. <laughs> and he'd set it down, and I'd watch him, and sometimes he'd set it down and just move away from it. Yeah. So we'll go to the bar and order a drink, and I'd go and grab the thing, briefcase, and I'd hide it, you know? And he'd come back go, what, 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 what happened? Where's my briefcase? What? And we're all laughing, Ronnie included, because <laughs> they, they saw me do it. Right. And Ronnie thought it was great. He loved it. So uh, <laughs> I do that all the time. Then one time, I think it was up to Ronnie that, that did it. He said, let's, the pyro guy put a little charge on the briefcase. And they put it there, and they, and they watched <laughs> me go for it. And I picked it up, and it blew up. <laughs> Ah! <laughs> I might have stopped that then. That was an item. <laughs> but I didn't realize, you know what? This is the money. Right. I actually gotten lost. I right, did right. deep shit, you know. So Oh, totally. Okay. <laughs> okay, so is there a song that you wish you played on, even if it's a selfish want across any artist? Is there one tune that you like, man, I wish I was on that recording? Um well, I love Zeppelin. An immigrant song is fun. You know, I do a lot of rock fantasy camps, and uh, yeah. I'll fix that. Oop, wrong side. <laughs> that way. Okay, it's right. opposite on the camera. So uh, we play. You know, they go, well, there's a lot of jamming on those camps. So it's like, uh, let, you guys know in the immigrant song, yeah. So we play that, and that's a fun song to play. You know, it's up oh, tempo totally. and you kick ass on that thing. So, okay, so uh yeah so what a month he had so you started out at one point turning down the gig with ozzy just because you talked to your brother and you said there's too much shenanigans going on and then yeah. you're in sabbath so did you have a feeling at that time that it it was circling you it was only a matter of time before you got into this whatever it was going to be like uh yeah you know it's it's like uh it's like when a band or somebody writes songs, there's a window of all this great stuff coming out, you know? Right. And, uh, and then later on, it's not so great, you know? So sure. this is one of those time frames where I got a call from Sharon Osbourne and then I got a call later on from Black Sabbath. Now that's a good month or two. Yeah, I'd say. <laughs> so, um, so, I thought, well, the thing with Ozzy, I had to fly to England. Right. I said, well, we'll fly to England and you hang out with Ozzy. And then I asked my brother, I said, is Ozzy crazy? Is he nuts? And he goes, well, yeah, he's pretty crazy, blah, blah, blah. So they kind of <laughs> steered me off of that, and I didn't do it. And yeah. then uh, when Sabbath called, they were in L.A. And they said, you want to come down and meet Tony Iommi? Because they're looking for a drummer. We heard about you, blah, blah, yeah. blah. So uh, I said, yeah. So I went to Hollywood, and then what was it? I think I lived in Hollywood at the time. So I met Tony and he had that Axis album and invited me down. We, we hit it off right away. And the uh, first song we played was Neon Nights. And then 40 something years later, that was the last song I played with Ronnie. Yeah. The last that show we that blows did. my mind. I know. It's weird because that song's been moved. Sometimes we opened right. with it. Sometimes it was in the middle. Sometimes it's at the end or an encore. Sure. And that's what happened. So that yeah, song that's had a. That's mind blowing. Journey. Huh? That's mind that? blowing. You know? Yeah, yeah. It, it's like, wow. Unbelievable. Yeah. So, so now you're in you're in Sabbath now, and you said you weren't a huge fan of them. You knew some of their catalog. Um, what was your approach to learning the tracks on such short notice and start playing with them? Well, I had to listen. We only had four days rehearsal. So the re the first rehearsal, we got down there and uh we played whatever I could play. <laughs> and, and then they were so happy they found a drummer and can continue right that they went to the pub <laughs> yeah, yeah we got a drummer man You'll and, be they went fine. The and then they left me back at the rehearsal with jeff nichols the keyboard player luckily yeah. and he helped me through the songs he had a, a old walkman cassette and i listened to it <clears throat> and i started making charts in a book so uh, second rehearsal, we played a lot more, but then they went to the pub again. Then the third rehearsal, everybody's starting to go, uh-oh, we better really start getting <laughs> down. And right. the fourth rehearsal, 
they would get nervous, you know. So I had a whole book of the set, all the songs, right. you know. Just which probably made them feel a lot better that you could write. Yeah, it wasn't exactly a chart, but it was sure. uh cheat sheet, you know. A reference, yeah. Intro four four times and uh guitar intro this, that, but you know, some of that old Sabbath stuff is back and forth and tempos are different. <clears throat> so it was quite a, a challenge, you know. A lot of times during that first gig, which was Hawaii, Aloha Stadium, 50,000, 60,000 people. A lot of that gig was that the song got to the end, and I'm like, I got to think about this. <laughs> so I'm going, not yet, not yet. Don't end it yet. Then finally we ended it. So a lot of long endings on these songs, but uh, that right. got me through. And... Uh, and then, uh, so I just listened to what Bill Ward did, <clears throat> who's incredible, you know, the way he right. approached that stuff. He, like no other drummer could play that. And uh, and I tried to emulate Bill and then put some of me in there too. You right. know, what I felt, because I didn't want to be totally glued to that and I can't play. I'd feel more relaxed if I could play a little bit in there. So that's what I did. I just kept my eyes open and ears open. Then I realized how Tony Iommi plays behind the beat, yeah. you know, with keys. And uh, that's how I learned how to play. Whoa, you play behind. It's heavy. It's, you know, evil sounding. So, <clears throat> so that's how I did it. You know, I just kept my eyes open, you know. So the, the first gig with Sam is, like you said, Aloha Stadium, 60,000 people. I'm assuming it was probably the most people you played in at that point, right? No pressure. <clears throat> no, I think with Axis, I played to 20 people somewhere. So. <laughs> nice, nice. So yeah, playing in front of 60,000 people and trying so, to learn the songs. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, actually before, before this, I played with Rick Derringer, and we started out playing He's clubs, playing. Yeah. and then we did yeah. – uh, then we did – a tour with Aerosmith, the Rocks tour. So we went from clubs to all of a sudden we're playing arenas and we're opening, but I realized how different playing an arena is because the sound is different. Right. The space is different. You got this big stage, even though we were pushed to the front, but uh, you realize, wow, this is a different animal playing here. So I learned from that. And yeah. then, uh, uh, then later on with Sabbath, we were in arenas again. So I was at least used to it somewhat, you know. Right. And you yeah, have so to learn how to perform in a different manner because you want to make sure all the <clears throat> people in the back and you start. Yeah, it's kid more exaggerated. Party. Yeah. I'm pretty yeah. sure I saw you with Derringer then back then um, at the old Comiskey Park in Chicago. You Comiskey remember, Park. Remember playing there? Yeah. Yeah. With, with, with uh, Aerosmith yeah, and I think uh, – Jeff Beck, when the fire happened, the fire happened. The fire, yeah, was, when Beck yeah. was on stage, yeah, I was at that yeah. show, so I got to see you then. I didn't even realize it back then. I got to right. see you then. Yeah, yeah, that was. Uh, I think Ted Nugent on some of those shows. It was fun. Yeah. Then Nugent we opened up for Boston. Field. We opened for Boston. Boston took oh, us on the tour, and they used to watch Rick to see how he handled the crowd because they yeah. went from, you know, a club band into boom, we're headlining. Right. arenas and they didn't exactly probably know what to do you know and they watched rick because he was a pro so uh but we became good friends we went on that plane and you know so that that was cool a 23 years old to get on the plane there's a nice oh, stewardess there with fresh donuts sure. hey i can get you powder donuts yeah yeah, yeah. donuts uh, <laughs> nice all right what else you want yeah that, that was back in the day back in the 70s and early 80s when they had killer shows they had great oh, yeah. opening bands great headline bands all these fests I, I can't tell you how many times i saw two major bands playing with each other just you don't see that as much as you used to unless you go to a fest yeah we're going to we're doing the m3 festival this weekend we play on oh, okay oh our yeah. friends our friends out there so yeah yeah so uh, Pat and, we're doing that. Out there. and then we're doing a pits what is it pittsburgh jurgles rhythm club uh, we're last in line with doing this. So, in and out, real These quick. Guys, now, when you were playing with uh, uh, Derringer, were any of the, were the winners involved at all, or did you get to jam with any of the, any of the bro uh, No, and actually, I never met them. Okay, I never met Johnny. I never met Edgar. And uh, you know, mm -mm. 
remember Rick had a party at his house. He had a great brownstone in New York City. <clears throat> and uh, he had a party, he invited John Belushi, Steven Tyler, and all these people. And they had like a real big dinner, fish dinner and all this shit. And I don't eat fish. So <laughs> I ate tuna fish sandwiches. And then right. I made him make me a bologna sandwich. That's how young I was. <laughs> this girl I date always screams at me when I when I sit not screams, but gives me shit every time I call it a tuna fish sandwich. She goes, Why? Do you call it a cow hamburger? Tuna well, is implied. I'm like, well, you know. How, what else could you call it? <laughs> tuna sandwich? Yeah, I don't she know. just wanted to say tuna. tuna. Just tuna. tuna. Yeah. I don't know. Me, my brother Carmine, and my other brother Frank. We were all tuna fish sandwich guys. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, that's how I lost uh, like 35 pounds. Tuna fish sandwiches on rye and uh, get an electronic drum kit. And uh, I don't you know. We used them. to do this is really disgusting to some people. <laughs> Carmine and I used to make the tuna fish sandwich. Then we'd have chocolate milk with it. Oh, my God. But we used to dunk the sandwich in the chocolate milk. <laughs> no. It was, was it toasted. <laughs> nope. Oh, white bread. You yeah. are and I tell people that they go, oh my god, that's disgusting. I was like, try it. Right. It's really good. <laughs> yeah, Even the milk brother, is good. Yeah, I'm me and my brother, until you tried it. Yeah, me yeah. and my brother used to take like a half stick of margarine, put a shitload of brown sugar in there, mash it up, and then eat it. You know, of what margarine? Just butter? Yeah, Just butter? yeah, Ooh. yeah. You know, that was good for you. That, yeah, uh, that does explain a lot, though, Vince. That and then grandma lot, eating, ap eating yeah. uh, onions like apples, you know. That's probably good for you. <laughs> yeah. That's but the favorite actually, thing when I, I was working with my grandma on the, on the yard when I was four or five, and when she took out a salt shaker and radishes from her apron, you know, you're going to hear some cool stories, you know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but that was the old way. That, that stuff was probably good for you. Oh, for sure. Absolutely. Garlic, so, people eat garlic raw and all that stuff. So. Oh, yeah. So the other night, I put on the remastered deal live uh, at Super Rock in Japan. Oh, really? I didn't oh. even hear about that. Holy shit. 15 seconds in the, in the King of Rock and Roll, which is the opening tune, my son comes out with his laptop and sits down on the couch and doesn't move for an hour and 17 minutes because that's Oh, really? Wow. <laughs> that's and, uh, oh, it sounds, the whole show is beautiful. I'm like, look at that, you know. No production. It's just a band. No backing tracks. Just guys out there clanging it out. Ronnie yeah. sounds fantastic. You're amazing. You know, and Thank people you. tried to emulate your sound for so long. And what I'm hearing lately, because we're on the search for new music, a lot of it's hard rock. Yeah. Your cymbal hits seem to be coming back in into the um whatever you call it, you know, whatever's happening. Right. You know, he used to like to hit you know the bell on top of the cymbal and a lot of I'm hearing that again, like your type of ride hit, right, is coming back. You know, well, I I, <clears throat> I play with the butt end of the stick. I don't right. play with the tip, first of all, so it gives you a different sound. <laughs> right. And I always said they go, "Why do you play with the butt end?" And I turn the stick around and I said, "Well, this part with the bead, yeah, is, is for girls." And then they go, "Oh." <laughs> Then they go, I'm only kidding, because there's a lot of great female <laughs> drummers out there. Oh, for sure. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So there's a certain way to hit the cymbals and a certain way to hit the drums. Like these drums back here, you know, I'll play them really hard and beat the hell out of them. And, but there's no dents on the drum heads. Right. Because I'm hitting correctly and uh, getting the power without killing the drum set. Yeah. You know? And uh, so it's all a matter of what you're comfortable with and, and learning how to hit, you know, not breaking everything. So, right. Yeah. And because of that, I always have played my, you know, my right hand upside down, like you for, so the thick, thick the man's way. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, beat for the women, you know, but, uh, okay. So when, uh, <clears throat> when Vivian left Dio and I, and I've heard you in an interview before talk about, you know, Oh, this is what's going on. And, you know, Ronnie made a change. Whatever this backstory was doesn't matter. Great music, great band. And um, sometimes when you lose an ingredient, it's not the the Dio band with you and Viv. I think is I one kick. of the best bands ever. And not to take away anything after he left, 
Right. You know what I mean? But that the chemistry of you guys. That's right. Was fucking unbelievable. Yeah. It's just like Zeppelin, you know, those four guys it's happening, man. Right. You know? And uh you take away one of them, you know. I mean, when John Bonham was gone later on, they played some gigs with Jason, who's great, but yeah. it, it's not the same band, you know. And the right. same thing happened with us. We just locked in together. It just came yeah. together. It wasn't right anything on paper like this guy would be good. And then when Viv left, uh, he actually he got fired. You know, Ronnie and Wendy. Yeah, they fired him, and uh, it was more of a business problem than anything. Sure. And uh, then they got Craig Goldie, who's a good friend and a great player, and uh, right. the band continued, but yeah, it wasn't quite the same, you know. Not and then, funny, uh, but it wasn't the same band. And then we wrote songs; they weren't quite the same. Right. Uh, it wasn't Craig's fault, but the, just the environment changed, and uh, sure. and then you know, ticket sales were going down a little bit at a time, and uh, the whole thing changed. Now, were you in a position yourself with Ronnie that you said, eh, maybe that's not the best or Ronnie, the boss. And then, you know, you just, well, worked. Ronnie was the boss, you know? So yeah. at that point I couldn't say to, couldn't really tell Ronnie. You sh I did that. Uh, are you sure you want to do this? Okay. Gotcha. It's okay, been yeah. successful. Right. Um, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Whatever. You're the boss, you know, you're the captain. So uh, that's what happened, you know, and um, <clears throat> and now it's funny. I'm playing with Viv this weekend. <laughs> right. And how does that feel? How does that feel to oh, be back playing with those guys? You know, me and Viv play so well together. He knows the way I play because I do a lot of crazy fills and yeah, I play fills where no man has gone before. You know, I'll start them in the middle and and he sometimes just holding it and I'm doing a <laughs> bar and a half fill or two bars and he's right. just waiting for me to come back in you can see him smiling and shit so we play off each other and then he tears into his solos which are amazing you know for fans that was traumatic when vivian campbell left dio i mean it was almost yeah. as traumatic as dave leaving van halen i mean it, it was a big like musical divorce of the time you know yeah you guys were on you were the man on the silver mountain you guys were yeah, on top yeah, you know, and fantastic. And I myself, if that was my band, I wouldn't change a thing. Go, wait, right. this works. And, it, and right. that's why I was always surprised with the formation of Last in Line. I think that's bad. That uh, when Vivian, as you said, left on, not under the great circumstances, that he kind of wanted to come back and do something. I thought he would have had a bad taste left in his mouth, but obviously not. That you guys all well, he had a, he had somewhat of a bad taste, but but. This wasn't anything to do with uh, with that. The, with that, you know. Well, actually, the way it started was uh, <laughs> Tiff called me up one day, said, "Hey, I'm in town, and I just spoke to Jimmy, and uh, he's up for a jam. You want a jam?" I said, "Yeah, let's do it." So we went into a little rehearsal place, and we started playing all the old songs, trying to learn them again. And he's learning the solos, and we had a lot of fun. So we decided to do the same thing the next week. Yeah. And Andy Freeman was in town. I know Andy. We played together on uh, with George Lynch for a little tiny bit. And I invited him down, and he came down. And he started singing these songs. He knew them. And right. we were blown away, like, holy shit, this guy could sing. And then uh, that led to, you want to do some gigs? You know, which right. led to gigs. We went to Europe. Steve Strange, may he rest in peace, was our manager. And then uh, he got us a deal on Frontier Records. We did two records with them. So it's, it evolved into, uh, you know, real band. We started writing originals. But mainly it just started as fun. It wasn't anything like, hey, let's put something together yeah. and try to make some money. It wasn't anything like that. that so how did you album know? Is, is, I'm a, just real quick, Vince. I just want to say that first album you guys did with Last in Line, the very first time I heard The Devil and Me, was just one of those holy shit moments. That song <laughs> is kick ass. Yeah. And I was fortunate enough to see you guys a couple, three times. I'm going to see you again later in October here at the Arcada. Uh, amazing on stage. The, the chemistry between you guys is amazing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, we only did a, 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 not many gigs. I think we only did one gig or two with Jimmy. And then he uh, passed away. And we had uh, 
what are we going to do now? We waited a bit, and then we started listening to bass players, and Phil Shusam was a good friend of all of us. Yeah. And he was from the same era and same camp, even kind of from far away. It looks like Jimmy, the hair, the black hair. <clears throat> so Phil joined, and then we've been doing so many gigs. It's tight. Like, we haven't played since January, and we're going to play a big festival uh, Saturday. Mm-hmm. But we don't have any rehearsal. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> so that puts you on edge. Like, I actually put up some of the songs uh, – two days ago to listen, make sure right. I'm refreshed. And, uh, you know, but we can look at each other and go, okay, now. And, you know, right, shit. right. When okay. we don't want to be perfect. So, you know? so how did it feel when you were with all these guys again and you started writing new music? And then I thought Ronnie, it was great. And then Ronnie wasn't around. Was he in the room, kind of? You know, even Ooh. though he's not here. Ronnie oh, with Dio. Room. But with you're talking that. about Dio? Yeah, no, right in front the last in line. Last yeah. in line. Oh, 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 oh. Did you feel yeah. it? Like, do you feel Ronnie's presence in the room? Nah, or nah. You guys, like, just cool. This is, you nah. know. Now nah, we All just right. got together and we were on our own, blah, blah, blah. blah. What, did, what did, uh, what was weird was after Ronnie passed, there was a show in London, an outside, outside festival. I don't know if it was Download or one of those, but one of those festivals. And we were rehearsing in Wales, New Tony Geezer, and I think Jeff Nichols was there. And we had Glenn Hughes singing. Oh, wow. And we had to go over the song, so Glenn came in. But when we played Heaven and Hell, it was a weird vibe in the room. Like, wow, I could feel Ronnie almost, you know, because that was his right. song, his, you know, yeah. Sabbath. And... uh I thought, wow, this is really, it was kind of sad, you know? You're going, da, right. da, 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 sing me a song, and it's not Ronnie. Right. Like, and this is the band, you know? So that was a weird uh, experience. Glenn's I, fantastic. I, I, on that, I, Ronnie is, loved on that Glenn. Note, on, on, that, on that note, though, Vinny, um, have you seen or heard about, I saw the show a couple of years ago, and I know I probably shouldn't have liked it, but I did. Did you see the deal or hear anything about the deal hologram show? Uh, I know of it, but I just seen yeah. a blip. I mean, they had Greg Goldie was on guitar, and I forgot who else was on vocals. It was pretty amazing. I saw it at the Arcada. It's pretty amazing. You you know, you got a hologram of Ronnie up there for like five or six songs, and obviously right. it's not him. And I know a lot of diehards say that's just not right, but it was still kind of cool. I think what happened way. was the hologram wanted more money per show. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know That's hologram right. could do that. They're like, what do you think? The money's yeah. gonna come out of thin air. <laughs> yes, yeah, so, so what are your yeah, thoughts? I, I, I never seen it, so I can't tell you. I just saw a little yeah, clip. It was it was cool away. and yet eerie in a way, but it was cool. Because I was yeah. fortunate enough to see Ronnie with Heaven and Hell with Sabbath and as a solo artist. I never saw him with Elf, but I was fortunate yeah. enough to see Ronnie and what an amazing yeah. um an amazing person. I mean, you've probably heard the story a million times. I saw Lizzie Hale talking once, and she said that she uh, was backing up when she was just first starting. She opened for Ronnie, and she said that they were getting on the bus ready to go, and Ronnie made sure he thanked everybody, and he was talking to all of the fans. And she went up to him, and she said, I noticed you just sit there and spend so much time with the fans. And he said he put his finger up, and she said, when Ronnie James Dio puts his finger up, you listen. And he said, you're going to meet a million people. They're not gonna, you're not going to remember any of them. They're going to remember that one time they met you. Make that be memorable for them. Yeah. And I that's think right. that's such a great attitude. Well, Ronnie, uh, actually, Hailstorm opened up for Sabbath. <clears throat> uh, oh, it was a Sabbath. In okay. the 90s. In the 90s. I don't know if that was what she was talking about. but That's uh, probably what she was, yeah. Yeah, she's incredible. What a, an incredible singer. And um, Ronnie, not only... Re, when you meet Ronnie, he'll remember your name. You come back a year or two later and they'll go, hey, Fred, how you doing, man? You know, unlike me who can't even remember the guys in the band, you know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Who's yeah, that on this, Phil? We had Rudy Sarzo on uh, last month and he was talking and he can like remember like each date of every gig. Like I can't even remember what I ate yesterday. And he's yeah, just me too. 
oh yeah march uh 28th 1979 <clears throat> we we're here and yeah. then you know like what and then you get those people come you remember me what do i owe you money uh, <laughs> i was at the show in 86 oh yeah. that's the guy it. with the beer i was wasted <laughs> yeah. yeah i remember black you no, that was when you. i first joined black sabbath uh we were on the heaven and hell tour yeah. and i just got in the band and we were playing arenas we were upstate new york it was cold and we finished the show, we hung out a bit, and then uh, we took the limo, me and Ronnie, and they went up the ramp. We're gonna go back to the hotel. And by the fence, there were a bunch of kids, like probably 30 kids waiting. It's cold. Ronnie goes, stop the car. And I'm observing, going, hmm, okay. And Ronnie gets out and he goes there and signs the autographs for everybody and takes pictures. So I followed with him I wasn't very known at the time, but I, yeah. that's now I'm going to learn something here. And he got out and uh, did all that. And then we got back in, went to the hotel and he took care of his fans. He loved his fans. He loved the music. Even uh, when Dio started, we played uh, London Hammersmith uh, in London, the Hammersmith, Hammersmith Odeon. Uh, and that was in January and it was really cold. So after the show, we're up in the dressing room. And uh, they said, well, there's a bunch of punters out, out front. They're waiting for, waiting for you guys to leave. So Ronnie said, bring them in the place. It's cold, very cold out there. So they brought about 50 people in. And they sat in the front row. And then when we were ready, we came down. We signed everything. It was like a VIP without paying for a VIP. Right. It was nice. or organic, you know. So. He was always concerned with his fans. He, he always remembered everybody and uh, it's just an amazing human being, you know? Yeah, I was always amazed at how, how me and my buddies would always find out what hotel the band was staying in while in town and then try to party with the band, whatever. I mean, yeah, back then the circus, I mean, it's interesting going back now with people, you know, everyone's sober, at least for their performance or whatever. They may have a couple of cocktails, but like for the most part, you know, there's no, yeah. pe there's no more people throwing up in the corner and like all nah. this crazy stuff. Now so it's like, like, hey, did you bring an extra fiber pill? I forgot my <laughs> fiber pill. <laughs> Who took my Metamucil? Where's my blood pressure pill? Are you on? Oh, you got high blood pressure? Oh, yeah, me too. Right. <laughs> Who's got That's my memory totally changed? Race, damn it. Yeah, how's your neck holding up? My neck. Neck, neck and back from, from playing. No problem. No issue? Right on. Right on. Good genes. Yeah. I stretch every morning, you know, before I bop around and then uh, try to warm up before I play, you know, even on a pad or on my side of my shoe, sneakers. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I took care of myself. I didn't really get into drugs. We were, we were a bunch of potheads making Holy Diver and all. Ronnie yeah. and I, we were potheads for sure. Yeah. So Holy Diver is a lot of pot involved in that album. Well, I definitely speaking of that album, I mean, pot, listening to it for sure. <laughs> yeah. But you know what? Yeah, it, wasn't, wanna... it wasn't as strong as it is now. Oh my goodness! Tell me, but yeah. Now you're smoking. You go. I gotta lay on the couch for a minute. Yeah, I'm a bud tender during the day, so now I get to sell weed legally. Yeah. Funny how absolutely. things have changed. I stopped. I stopped smoking like 25 years ago. Yeah. And I go figures. I stop, and now it's legal. Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That would have gone good with your tuna fish sandwich dunked into chocolate Ooh, milk, too. I would oh. add two of them. And now, uh, like, speaking, of, go speaking ahead, of Holy Diver, I heard this, and, and I want you to clarify it or maybe put your spin on it. That when you guys recorded Holy Diver, you thought it would be funny, or you purposely put a backwards uh, line in the song Shame on the Night, yeah. Crucify the Diver, I believe it was, just to right. kind of mess with all that sat satanic nonsense yeah. that was going on back then and you put it in there but nobody really noticed it was even in there no because with sabbath they were you know saying oh, there's a backwards evil things on that album and uh mob rules and <clears throat> sabbath was evil it, it, we were even booked in phoenix on easter sunday and they boycotted us so we had to put the date to the next day on monday so yeah. they accused us of the band of all this stuff 
So when we did Holy Diver, we said, hey, let's put something backwards on there and see if anybody notices. So Ronnie goes, yeah, 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 good idea. So we did, um, cruc- Ronnie went out and went, crucify the diver. And then we had to back in, take the tape, reverse it, put it in there. And the very right. end, there's a voice that goes, yes, yes, after blah. And that's what he said. <laughs> nice. And there's another one in there because we were recording and the drums are here and the window is behind me to the control room. And uh, we were recording. Then my brother Carmine walked in to the control room. And I think Ronnie said in, in the mic, look behind you. I, look, I was Carmine. So we put that on there too, just look behind you. Nice. It's kind of like the airplanes now. They go, there's two exits in the front, two on the side, and there might be one behind you. Yeah. Oh, that's scary. <laughs> Since when did they start doing that? Right. Behind me. One of, the, one of the funniest things I remember from the, you know, when they were, everybody was big on the uh, satanic messages in the songs. And I think Ozzy was either with Sabbath or out of solo artist, and they were picketing his concert that night. And he went yeah. out there and he didn't even know who they were. And he just grabbed the sign and started picketing with them. <laughs> I didn't did. even know. No, Ozzy. Ozzy did. Oh, that. Ozzy. Then he just grabbed the sign and started picketing with them. Yes, band is showing. He's like, yeah, get this guy. Yeah, he didn't even it. know when we were recording we demos, what they were doing. <laughs> when we were recording demos, of course, we had the four track. And then we started messing around because we knew that you guys had done that on the Dio album. And we thought it was hilarious that you were fucking with people. Yeah. So like we start and we found, oh, we have the song. This is Slayer. And we played it backwards. And it's I am Satan. And we were like, no way. We weren't even trying, you know, but we were oh, like, really? Yeah, and it's like it's so easy for anything. You can almost hear what you want to hear in that. Yeah, yeah. That well, we really did it, you know. Actually, right, the, right, song, right. the song "Invisible." Ronnie wanted it to start with a like a, right. a ghosty kind of thing. So how are we going to do that? We didn't have computers, right. so it sounds like air escaping, maybe from a tire. And uh, actually, the pot dealer said, "I got a spare tire in my truck." We'll bring it in. So we brought it in, and we actually mic'd up a spare tire. It's probably the awesome. first spare tire recorded ever. And then we said, okay, let's test it. He let some air out, and then we got the level, and we did a couple of those and put them together, and that's the beginning of Invisible. Yeah. But we, we were like, anything goes. Any crazy idea, we tried it. <laughs> so like, great well, album. like now the, the music, you know, the way that it – works now or not working or however it's changed um the band seemed to be closer to the fans rather than you know like something you couldn't reach or you wanted to aspire to back in the 80s and not you know when everyone was doing big stadium stuff right rock stars were you know if you met one you were lucky you know what i mean and now you get to actually well, the internet probably part of the business model, you know. Yeah, the internet, yeah. and you, you can find out information. You can find out, like you said, where they are, what hotels, and right. and then uh, live streams and interviews and things like that. You feel closer to the, those people, and then uh, and a lot of people playing smaller venues, right? And um, easy to get to, you know. I did a tour with Sabbath Nights in uh, South America, and when was that? November, October, November. And they went berserk. I've been there about five or six times. Yeah. And when we played like Heaven and Hell, there were people in the audience with tears. That's like awesome. Children of the Sea. We started and the girls are like, oh. and I had a great band. Actually, this is the singer's band. Sinister, Sinister. right? Yeah. yeah. And uh, down there, we had a great band. And uh, it was like the Beatles were there, you know? I mean, we played big clubs five six hundred people but they were packed and people so passionate about ronnie yeah and and sabbath dio that i mean there's tears come and big bikers you know tattoos and that change and we start playing children to see and (laughs) then look at it crying (laughs) holy shit that's awesome though it's got to make you feel great this many years later that the reaction is still that yeah powerful. these songs are 45 years old and, right. and they still touch people like that and uh ronnie still touches people i'm able to s- survive all these years from having that foundation and right. um you know, and the people down there are so passionate about their music They're oh so absolutely amazing people down there 
I uh, hope to go again, maybe the beginning of next year or something, you know. But uh, this this music, no, nobody thought it would last this long, you know. So Oh, for sure. So I want to know about the hearing aid recording sessions. I mean, talk about the assembly of at, at the time, all the heavy metal legends in one spot. Was it a more of a nightmare than? Well, you know what? When we first started, Jimmy and Viv put that song together. Then Ronnie wrote, wrote the lyrics. So we want to record it. We went back to Sound City. That's where we did Holy Diver and worked a lot. And Frankie Benelli was on the drum set, and I was on the drum set. Mm -hmm. So we actually recorded the basic track with both of us playing. That's awesome. Same time. We didn't overdub it. We didn't do any of that trick stuff. Uh, we just played it more straight so we didn't get in each other's way. <clears throat> and Viv and Jimmy were playing, and then Ronnie sang a scratch vocal. And uh, and we got the track, and that was cool. And I didn't really go down to some of those sessions. There was too many people. Yeah. You know, all these, especially egos. guitar players. Yeah, all the egos. <laughs> they, they're coming in. George Lynch comes in, and then uh, who else? Uh, they did guitars in one section, you know. Right. And then vocalists, all these vocalists coming in. Rob Halford, then he hung out for a bit, did his thing. Then uh, Jeff Tate. And yeah. So I came to some of them a little bit. And I thought, yeah. This is Je no. Jeff Tate tells the story that he kept his shades on because he was shitting his pants because he had to sing in front of Ronnie. Well, a lot of guys were shitting their pants to sing in front of Ronnie. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> They're going, oh, shit, you know. And uh, so. I didn't go to every, every, I, you know, hung out a little bit and then yeah. I left. It was too crazy. It's too many people and they needed to get it done. So with everybody in the control and it was, Hey, yeah, hey, what are you, Hey, where are you going on tour? What are you doing? What are you doing? There's a big social event going on. So I thought, damn, eh, it's too many people here. So I didn't go. So what, what, like when you're hanging out with your brother and you know, both you guys got busy schedules and stuff. Do you ever just sit down like, you know, salute each other with the drink and say not bad no we usually sit down and go hey did you take your fiber pill <laughs> hmm. what's what's your blood pressure <laughs> no we never did that interesting interesting you know because few people get to leave their mark once fewer people give to leave their mic mark twice then there's a a very small number that get to leave their mark beyond that and that's yeah we're still going yeah you guys are just i mean yeah we both love to play carmine 70 uh yeah. seven years old and, and it's gonna be 78 he kicks ass i mean yeah he kicks ass he plays his ass off and it, it's scary you go how's he doing that you know i mean between and, uh, both of you, your band your resumes are just fucking insane yeah, but you know it's funny. He's doing a thing called uh, uh, the Rod Experience, so he's got a really good band, and yeah. they're, they're playing uh, the tunes from from Rod from his era too. Yeah, and it shows are doing really good. So he's doing that. It's kind of a tribute to Rod. Right. And then I started this Sabbath Nights thing because I've done it before, and then Viv's going off with Def Leppard, so we're not playing. Right. So now we're both playing with tributes of our career. <laughs> yeah. That's know? awesome though. I know. Yeah, it's you like can celebrate that weird. people are celebrating what I mean, you got you know you what know came before. How you're a major influence. You, your brother knows he's a major influence on people who play. Yeah. And you know, and it's interesting that Rod Stewart now just came out with the big band album with Jules Holland. Right. And he's doing that kind of stuff because he's I guess he's uh you know, rock and roll is in his past, but I mean, between the both of you, you guys' resumes just, I mean, it's half of rock music, yeah. at least the good <laughs> stuff. Yeah. I mean, we were lucky. <laughs> you know, it's unusual that we both play the same instrument. Right. And then, then for me to start, I'm, I'm 11 years old, younger, and then to actually try to make it in the business, right. I was lucky and, and I got, got going with it, you know, and then we were both successful. So it's kind of yeah. unusual. And obviously you had great parents. I mean, they supported you. Parents were great. You know, yeah. so did they get to see you rise to fame in Black Sabbath and Dio? Were they still around when that? When <clears throat> oh, yeah, yeah. My mother and father would come to Madison Square Garden. We're playing there. <clears throat> and uh, 
when the kids stood up, she's going, take it, sit down. I can't see. Sit down. <laughs> stop, po- stop smoking that pot. Sit right. down. She, was, she loved it. She loved it's it. so they funny, man. Paid. Everyone's got a voice they use for their mom. You know, everyone. My mom, yeah. when I play with John Lennon, I mean, we used to hang out. I smoked a lot of joints with John Lennon. That's and incredible. we'd sit down, we're talking about Italian food. And I told John that my parents uh, are Italian. My grandmother and grandfather are from Italy. And we, my mother makes a killer lasagna. We're talking about food. I said, I'm going to have her make you some. So about a couple of days later, she made a pan of lasagna in her pan. I brought it into the studio. I see John, I give it to him. So he was like, oh, cool. Now, uh, he was happy. Right. And then about a month later, my brother's playing with Rod Stewart at Madison Square Garden. There's a big party because they're doing like six nights. And my parents went because they loved going to the, sh- to the shows. Yeah. And they were backstage. And my mother sees uh, John Lennon. She goes, there's John Lennon to my father. And Carmine goes, yeah, you want to meet him? I'll bring you over. So Carmine brought them over yeah. and said, hi, John. I'm Carmine. This is my parents. This is Vinny's parents. She made you the lasagna. Oh, and they talked, and he hugged her, and blah, 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 blah. And after a bit, they, they talked, blah, blah, blah. She asked John, did you bring my pan? Dude, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I need the pan. Oh, she asked, that's classic. She asked oh. John Lennon if he brought oh, the awesome. pan. I knew that was coming. Because that was the Italian pan in the family. Had right. all yeah. the baking and yeah, everything. Oh, that was the oh, Could so have been the president of the United States. Didn't matter. <laughs> from my mother from Brooklyn going, did you bring the pan? Like she oh. thought maybe John was home before he left. Maybe I'll bring the lasagna pan <laughs> in case right. I see Vinny's Yoko. pan. Yeah. <laughs> But we don't know where that's the pan so is. We fine. think Yoko has it. So oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> Watch it's in like some museum. The the pan that John uh, Lennon made was on. yeah. Okay, so if you could talk to your younger self before every all this happened for just one minute, what would you say? Uh, get better earplugs. <laughs> yes, right now I'm on closed caption on all the TVs in this house. Oh, I started and, uh, doing that. I, I I'm not wearing ear. ear um, what you might call it? hearing aids hearing so yeah. so i hear what i want to hear right <laughs> selective hearing. but you know but I, but i would say to me and any other person that's young getting into business make sure you watch the business end of it right uh, the money is in the songwriting and the publishing and percentages it's not in uh oh here's money go play every week because once the tour stops then you get there's no money Right. So you got to be part of what you're doing and uh, have ownership in some of this stuff. And that's the way you'll survive because I, uh, you know, now 40 years later, Holy Diver is still selling, uh, mob rules still selling. So there's royalties generated and performance fees and stuff like that. So, uh, that you got to be smart about the business business part of it too. So, yeah. we And we've noticed, uh, a lot of people are going to power trios just because it's, on the road it's more feasible it's cheaper <laughs> yeah economically that's what we figured out wait a minute well we didn't do that you know right right I mean, no but i've seen like other bands we kind of noticed we're like is that i'm sure it I, figures i'm in. just going out as myself oh, me right. black sabbath <laughs> nights and it's just me yeah and you gotta hone the song in your head so we don't right. have to bring production or anything exactly and then everyone's very cheap you know, comes with the bic lighter yeah. um so do you still have two bands that do the Sabbath nights with you, East Coast and West Coast? I got two bands. Yeah, one's the East Coast. I have three bands. One's in South America. Killer oh, okay. Band. East Coast band. Uh, Jim Crean singing. And uh, Jim Crean, uh, he sang with us with uh, stuff Carmine and I did together. Gigs yeah. and the album we did. He's a great singer, great guy. And uh, he sings on the East Coast and on the West Coast. We're doing some couple of shows on the West Coast. And then uh, we got different bass player and guitar player on the East Coast. The Okada Theater will be the East Coast band. And it, it kicks ass. It yeah. all kicks ass. So Because oh. uh, right now it's too expensive to fly people all the way right. to West Coast, then all yeah. the way back and all that. And a lot of people don't understand that. I mean, there's, you know, there's yeah. 
only so many venues. There's only so well, many. Plus, the airline tickets are stupid. Now. Oh, it's you ridiculous. Know, you fly across the country, it could be six, seven hundred, eight hundred bucks. You go, what are these out of their minds? Oh, it's totally. Just to be a, a two hundred plus ticket, right? And you know the money they want. So you got to, whoa, this can't happen. You know, because uh, unless the band's making a lot of money, that's the way. Right. You yeah. Budget, so. Guarantees for sure. It's all good. Oh, absolutely. Look at that monster kit. There you go. That's not even the monster kit. That's I know, three. yeah. Have the the three up, yeah. <laughs> That's the three monster take, kit. How long does it take to set that up? I don't know. I never set it up. Why well, not? Yeah. <laughs> how long does it take your tech to set it up? But, uh, not not long. Probably an hour. Okay. He that's the kit on the first Heaven and Hell tour. Then the second Heaven and Hell tour, I got a bigger kit, twenty one pieces. Yeah. And they were up here. They were here behind me. Boom, boom. I'd hit them like this hard. Yeah, this that's hard. The after the tour. The yeah. yeah, boom, 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 and after the tour, I couldn't move my arm. Oh shit! You're right. <laughs> the tendon yeah. came off. Okay, snapped off. Went down here somewhere. Wow! <clears throat> I couldn't move my arm, and uh, the other shoulder burned. So what? I had to get so uh, shoulder surgery. Yeah. On this one, and then go to rehab and all that shit and uh, rehabilitation, yeah. I should say. And uh, from playing like this and this way and backwards. Right. So as you can see, I don't do that anymore. Yeah, I see noticed that that, yeah, lately you're playing more, <laughs> more you know, see. flat. That's it, baby. Right there. Yeah. See those symbols are low? Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Right on. Well, and then my so brother her, I, destroyed his shoulder. Too, so can't do Just that. a quick question. I always kind of want to ask a drummer that. How incredible is... Uh, I think Rick Allen, right, from Def Leppard with the one arm. How absolutely incredible is that feat? I know. That's incredible that he uh, <clears throat> he didn't turn around and go, yeah, that's it, I'm over, I'm done, blah, 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 blah. Right. He, he wanted to keep playing, and he incorporated using his feet with his one arm, and, uh, yeah. and it worked. I even told him last time I saw him, I said, man, you're an inspiration for so oh, many absolutely. people, especially drummers, and you just turn this around from – something negative into i'm going i'm keep going so oh totally you know and, and kudos incredible. to his and his friends and bandmates for saying okay we can figure this out that's the key you know the key. luckily the band luckily the band was cool and they they gave right. him a, a shot and uh he made it work you know yeah you know, i i had a disability i had a disability service company and you know so i'd work with a lot of young kids and stuff and you his influence is definitely out yeah. there people aren't afraid to pick up sticks they're not afraid to you know we can make something up for my one these arm. guys on yeah. the internet playing with their feet yeah. they got no arms guitar yeah. like, absolutely oh, yeah that's incredible so i got about another 10 minutes or five ten minutes i yeah just, just wanted to thank you for coming on Vinny. uh we oh, yeah. appreciate your time you're definitely you know when we think of heavy metal and the way it should be played we think of your skins being slammed by your that's and fiber pills. Uh, yeah, fiber pills. <laughs> fiber pills and, and your mom's lasagna. And remember, yeah. Frank. Where's Frank, my pen? Frank, Frank is app a C. App, app a C. And I wrote it down and I still screwed like it Like farm a yeah, C. Right. Yeah. I know. Yeah. I know. Fred Vinny, thank Reddit. you, sir. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, guys. And uh, Yeah, well, uh, I'll see you at the Arcade in a couple weeks. Uh, yeah, and check my nice. website. We got all the dates coming up and all the stuff that's going on. There's a lot of yeah, stuff I'm doing. Yeah. So, yeah, VinnyApsy.com or uh, Vinny Apathy official Facebook. Right on. And I'll be on at 4 p.m. L.A. time doing my stream. Right on. Time. Sounds great. Okay. Thank you, thank sir. You, guys. It's a pleasure. Thanks for talking. Thank you, Vinny. Appreciate okay, it. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.